We'll now continue talking about writing simple RISC-V assembly language programs. In part one, we discussed registers and the load store instructions and addressing modes. Part two went over arithmetic and logic instructions. And now we'll cover conditional and control flow instructions before we explain how procedure calls work. Our discussion continues to elaborate the RISC-V RV32I base integer instruction set with 32-bit instructions and word size. Remember that there are 32 general purpose registers of the RISC-V architecture with mnemonic names. These are the registers that a program uses explicitly for integer operations. Recall that the stateful elements of the computer that the program sees includes the program counter, which is a pointer to an instruction address, and the registers. Today we're going to discuss instructions that modify the program counter register to support conditional branches and loop structures and programs. Remember this example that calculates an absolute value without using a conditional statement? Let's quickly walk through it again before we look at a version using conditionals. The first line of C code becomes one instruction to shift the sign bit through the entire temporary register T0. Then the input parameter is added to the mask before XORing with the mask, putting the result into A0 to return it. The function returns with the return value in A0. Here's a little more direct way to find an absolute value using a conditional expression. This shows us a few new instructions and let's walk through this example. The SLT in mnemonic means set less than. This instruction sets the destination register to one if source one is less than source two and zero otherwise. We have a direct check here to compare if V is less than zero, that is if it is negative. So T0 will be set if V is negative and cleared or zero if V is non-negative. We'll take a closer look at other ways to use SLT in the future. Looking at the C code, we see it is a ternary operator. If you're not familiar with this operator, it encodes an if-else condition in one line. The if block follows the question mark and the else block follows the colon. So if V is less than zero, the statement should result in the negative unsigned long of unsigned int of V. And if V is greater than or equal to zero, the statement should result in V. The condition used in the assembly here is the less than inequality. We know that we have a zero in T zero if V is non-negative. We can use a branch if equal or BEQ instruction to compare T zero with zero. If the two registers are equal, then the program counter will become the address of the instruction located at the label provided in the branch instruction. Here that is .l2. Otherwise, if t0 is not zero, then the next instruction in program order will be fetched as usual. This means the program execution will branch if v is negative. From the C code, that means jumping to the code that follows the question mark, which will return the negation of the unsigned cast of v. The branch target is .l2, which is an assembler label that identifies the, the address of the instruction following the L2 label. If V is not negative, the PC will be advanced to the address of the next straight line instruction. Let's follow the not taken branch case first. We sometimes call this the fall through case because the program falls through the jump instead of hopping. This case is simple. Return V. Since V is in A0 already, it is ready to return. So the fall through code is just a ret in pseudo instruction. Now for the branch taking case, jumping to L2 sets the program counter to the address of the first instruction in the assembly code after the label. You'll usually see this written either on the same line as the label, or sometimes the label is written on a line by itself with the instruction on the next line. The label itself does not take up any space in the program. Adding a new line after the label does not change the instruction of the jump target. The first instruction after the label uses subtraction to negate A0, which holds V, putting the result into A0 so it is ready to return. Now A0 holds the positive of V, that is its absolute value. The next line of assembly is an unconditional jump back to the instruction at the L1 label. In general, when you have an if-else type of condition, you'll have two jumps. One jump to go over the fall-through code, and then another jump to rejoin the control flow after the paths down both if and else sides finish. 
In this case, the fall through code itself is where the two paths meet. Now the execution of ret will return the negation of v because that was written into a0 by the code at L2. Before we discuss loops, let's look at some simple C language transformations that get control flow code closer to the assembly equivalent. This will make our comparisons between high level and assembly easier. Here is a if else version of our absolute function. We can transform this to a go to version by using the logic of the test and using it to jump to the then part. If the jump isn't taken, then the else becomes the fall through code. Now we can generate assembly that looks almost identical to the C code. When transforming if else conditionals to go to statements, you can also complement the test condition and then switch the order of the then and else blocks to make them in the same order as the original. We'll start loops with the do while loop. This is the easiest to translate to assembly. Here's a function that implements pop count, an operation to count the number of one bits in a word. This is also known as the Hamming weight. This is a fairly straightforward loop-based implementation. It initializes the result with zero and then iteratively masks all but the least significant bit of the argument X and adds that into the result. This adds a one if the least significant bit is a one and zero otherwise. Then the argument gets shifted right by one bit, so this repeats until the argument is zero. Then we're done and return the result. We can translate this loop into a go-to based version first, before we look at the assembly version. The do turns into a jump target, which we label loop. The while x becomes a go-to back to the loop if x. The generated assembly is similar to the go-to structure. It starts by clearing t0 to hold the result. The start of the loop body is labeled L2. The loop body contains three assembly statements and the input argument with one, then add the result to the T0 intermediate result. Then the input register A0 is shifted right by one. The loop body ends with the conditional branch instruction back to L2 if the A0 register holding X is not zero. After the loop ends, the intermediate result is moved from T0 to A0 using an add i instruction with zero valued immediate followed by the return. So in general, a do while loop can be converted to this go to version with a label at the start of the loop, the loop body, and then an if of the test that will jump back to the start of the loop body if true. Conversion of this to assembly is relatively straightforward depending on how complex the body and the test are. One way to convert a while loop is to keep the structure but invert the test. The loop label comes before an if statement to check for the inverted test condition. If the test is not true, the loop is exited. Otherwise, the body of the loop is executed and then an unconditional jump is taken back to the start of the loop where the test is once again checked. Another way to do the while loops is to check the test and jump back to the loop body if it's true or else fall out of the loop. This is a way to convert a while loop to an equivalent version using go to. It generates code that is similar to the do while loop. Here's another implementation of pop count using a while loop. Functionally it is not much different from the do while loop except that it will not waste one execution of the loop body if x starts out equal to zero. The conversion to go to shows that the while statement gets replaced by a go to to the if statement after the loop body. Yet another way to translate a while loop is to convert it to a do while loop and then apply the go to transformation. The trick is to make sure the loop body doesn't get executed the first time if the test condition isn't met. This is done by adding an if on the inverted test condition with a go to to after the loop body. Then the loop body of a do while loop can be used since the if statement guards entry to the loop the first time through. Last but not least, we have the for loop. Remember that a for loop consists of four components. The init statement always runs prior to the loop. The test statement runs prior to each loop body and breaks the loop if the test is false. The update statement runs at the end of every loop body. So a loop iteration is a test, body, and update. 
here is a slightly different approach to writing pop count using a for loop. The init statement initializes two variables, r and i, to zero. The test statement checks if i is less than the w size macro. W size is written as a pound defined C preprocessor macro that will replace every instance of W size in the C code with the calculation of 4 times size of int, which on RISC V is 4 times 4, so 16. The update statement increments i by 1. The body is a little different than before. It doesn't modify the input argument, but instead shifts it by the iterator variable i and bitwise ands with 1 that gets added to r. Let's walk through converting this to a go-to version. As an intermediate step, we'll convert the for loop to an equivalent while loop. The init statement comes before the loop because it always gets executed. The test statement becomes the test of the while because it gets checked before executing each loop iteration. The body goes in the usual place. The important thing here is to put the update statement after the loop body before the end of the loop. So we can convert the pop count for into a pop count for while. The init statement will go first before the loop starts. Then we'll add the while statement with the test checking i is less than w size. We're going to put the update at the end of the body, so I left a little space here and we add the loop body before the update. From here, we could generate any of the while go to transformations to change it into go to based code. We can also generate a do while loop from the for loop. In this case, we put the init statements before the inverted if test that decides if we should not do the first iteration then the loop body followed by the update statement, then the test again for the iteration. What's interesting here is that often the compiler can determine that the first test passes for the initial conditions of the loop, such as this case, where zero is compared less than 32. This is always true, so the compiler can optimize away this code when it generates the assembly. So this can be a little bit more efficient than a straightforward transformation of the for while transformation.